Hi, I'm Nick Dawson, the Editor-in-Chief of TalkHouse Film, and you're listening to the TalkHouse Film Podcast. Almost always, the podcasts we do here at TalkHouse Film are pinned to the upcoming release of a particular movie. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just that there are two people whose work we love, who we figure might have fun talking to each other. That was the case with this week's podcast, which is a conversation between Indonesian-based Welshman Gareth Evans, the director of the incredible martial arts thrillers The Raid Redemption and The Raid 2, and Ben Wheatley, the English director behind the brilliantly dark and sometimes very funny films Down Terrace, Kill List, Sightseers in a Field in England. The two first met on the festival circuit three years ago and are friends on Twitter, so they had more than enough to talk about when we got them together for a chat on Skype. This reminds me of that time we did that podcast in Canada, in Toronto. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. That, that was the first time we met, wasn't it? Which was, uh, I, I think I just got off the plane and I didn't know what was going on. And I just got, I got driven to this place and they said, it's going to be an interview. And it was, did you know anything about it? Well, I, I knew a little bit about it. I think I was a little bit more clued up than you were, but only by about maybe one hour, two hours worth of being clued up. Because I know you yeah. just got off the plane and you had just arrived. And then, yeah, and there yeah. we were. Yeah, it was what was it? It was, a, it was a, I seem to remember it was like a hundred people or something like that. It was an audience, wasn't it? And it was for some podcast thing. And I was already quite drunk yeah. when I turned up. But <laughs> 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 well, that was the thing. Like for me, it was like it was this environment where I, you know I got told we were going to do a podcast on it, and I thought you know here we go. Like you know maybe just you know sat in some studio room and then record something. And then all of a sudden, there's like a live audience there. I think it was like it was Doug Benson's uh, podcast or something. And then, um, yeah, 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 and we were, and we were there, and I just remember being there, thinking, like, okay, uh, okay, because I knew you had a comedic background, and then they had like, a stand-up comedian, and then Doug himself was a comedian as well, and I was just sat there thinking, oh god, I need somebody to write some material for me right now, because <laughs> I hadn't seen the raid either at that point, so I, yeah, I, exactly, uh, it was all just, yeah, it was after the the, the kind of the bizarre kind of experience of doing a transatlantic flight and then into a room full of strangers yeah <laughs> but there you go you know these things happen but yeah that was quite a weird trip wasn't it because i remember because we got invited to the what we thought was the this the like a brunch for the end of the festival but it was actually the award ceremony where where they and they and where the raid won the um audience award and um, yeah, yeah. I, remember, I remember it was a particularly cruel one because they they count down from like there's only ten films in Midnight Madness. And I think they they do it. They they call them they call them out the top six, <laughs> <laughs> which, which we weren't anywhere in any of them. So yeah, so we came a close tenth, I think, on that one. But yeah, but that was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But that was the interesting thing for me because like I mean I. I, I'd heard like all the sort of like you know um, the, the accolades you guys got. Did you screen it? You screened it South by Southwest with Kill List first, right? Yeah, that was the first one for Kill List, and that was yeah. yeah. So I, I'd heard the buzz and I'd heard all, all about the movie and stuff, and so I was you know excited to see it. So we, was, we, our film screened on the first day of the festival, um, and we, at that point we were just thinking like, oh man, this might be the one and only time we ever get to get invited to a festival. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So we were like, you know, let's make it last. So we, we stuck around until about maybe like four or five days after the festival finished. So like that was part of my right. thing. Then it was like, all right, well, I got to be there for the last night. I got to see uh, Kill List because I'd heard so much about it and stuff. And yeah, man, it, I, mean, I mean, I've told you before anyway, but like that film blew me away. And like I just showed my DOP it about about two months ago. And um, yeah, it, he was uh, suitably freaking out throughout the, throughout the entire film. Oh uh, yeah, man. I mean, yeah, it was the, the 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 for us the the South by screening was the same thing where we never thought there was a good chance that that would have been the end. You know, mm-hmm. we had we had no uh, no, I, I didn't have any kind of inkling of which way the audience was going to go at all. You know, and uh, uh, we thought it was just as likely that they were everyone was going to scream at us that it was absolute shit as as um, as they were going to like it. So, it, but I don't know. I, I I get that feeling with all the films. You know, I don't necessarily. Then you can never take it for granted, can you? That it's going to be okay. No, no. You, it, it's that thing. There's nothing more nerve wracking, I guess, than that that moment when you just get up to introduce a film. And I, I hate doing introductions to films as well, because like you know, like I don't mind doing Q and As. I enjoy them because at least I know the answers. But when it comes to introducing, um, yeah, there's only so many. I mean, especially kind of films that I make. There's only so many times. I can kind of like rile up an audience by telling them about broken bones and things. It's like, you know, <laughs> after a while it gets stale. Um, I, I do remember I did, I did one intro for the film and it was the first time I've ever done this and it's probably going to be the last time I ever intro a film like this. It was more for like a sort of like an, an industry screening. 
so like you know, you're not going in for your sort of target demographic audience at all and so i just sat there and i'm just i just just froze like i just stood out there at the front and i was like oh i can't do any of the same shtick i've been doing for each festival so far and i just completely completely froze and i'm pretty sure i just said like okay um i fucking suck at introducing films but i'll be back to talk to you later and then just ran for the door it was the most <laughs> uncomfortable experience I had, I had a similar one in Cannes, and they did because I'd heard in Cannes that they don't do Q and A's. So I was like, "All oh, oh, right, that's brilliant. Okay, cool. So I can get away with that." And they said, but then when I, I got there, and they said, "Oh, you've got to do the introduction." I hadn't prepared anything, or hadn't even thought about it. And apparently, the, traditionally in Cannes, you do a long introduction and thank everyone. So All I got right. Up there, so I got up there and went, "Okay, enjoy." <laughs> <laughs> and then disappeared off. So and you didn't, you didn't call upon any like. No, I didn't thank anyone. You know, I, you know, I'm an idiot. I, yeah, but as time goes on, I don't know. I, I just get a terrible fear of, of forgetting anybody people's names. But I'm, I'm trying to make an effort about it now because it's. I know it's horribly insulting, but it's kind of. It, it, I, I get a complete. It's like a brain freeze. Yeah. It's awful. I had. I had one of those moments. I, I don't know because um, you you haven't done like commentaries for your films yet, no? Yeah, yeah, I did. I had done you... commentaries on all of them, I think. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to check that later. <laughs> but like, yeah, when, when I did a commentary for, um, I think it was the first raid. Uh, I did. I ended up having to do two commentaries, um, and one of them got completely lumped on me when I did one of the commentaries. It was like I didn't even know I was doing it that day, and then suddenly I'm in the room talking for like an hour and forty minutes. And I don't know how it, I just didn't mention my producer's name, not once, throughout <laughs> the entire thing. And I was thinking, oh, crap, what am I going to do here? And then thankfully, when I did the UK one, that was when I you know, mentioned him probably like overcompensated. And it was just all about him then for the rest of the thing. <laughs> I want to ask you about your shooting process, actually. Because um, yeah. I, I, I know yeah, we've talked about this on Twitter in the past, where I think we figured out that the amount of days I had to shoot the Raid 2 was pretty much the total days you've had for like three or four features already, maybe more. Yeah. Um, so how, I mean, I'm, in, how I'm extremely jealous this? of you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, but then I, at the same time, I'm just thinking, oh man, I really need to work fast. I really need to figure out how to do this stuff faster. I, I don't. I don't think. It, I don't think action can be done faster. I mean, I've done. I've, I've been. You know, I've just done a load of Doctor Who stuff, and there's a load of action in that. And it. it I think the, the weird thing was that, like I. After we did Down Terrace, I did some other little bits of pilot work for TV with exactly the same crew, and yeah. uh, but shot in a more traditional way, and it wasn't any faster than anything else, you know. But it was the, right. the, the thing about Down Terrace and and, and Kill List and Sightseers was they, they the the main difference is that they shot in a documentary style, so it is quick. But then I've yeah. watched the, I've watched the making of stuff for Raid and it looks pretty fast the way it's shot. I don't think it. I don't think you could shoot it any quicker. And especially with all that, what was really interesting is all the pre-planning stuff and all the uh, the, the basically shooting the film twice, isn't it? So you're shooting, you shoot shoot and edit the fight sequences beforehand, don't you? For in a re with, with the rehearsal stuff. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We do sort of like it's it's kind of like a previs thing where we do like yeah. a yeah like a video storyboard for the fights, and, and it came like first time we did it, it was for our, our first movie Maranta, and it was because like, you know, I, like I'd never even contemplated making a martial arts film before, and then suddenly there I was about to make my first one, and and so I I was I used it more like a safety net at first because I was so worried that I would like you know screw up and forget like you know how to piece this fight scene together or not wanting yeah. to kind of you know, leave anything to chance and then it's just become like a, a thing that we've just stuck with and have done ever since then. But yeah. they tend to be around about ninety five percent the same as what we had in the pre pre previous and what we end up with in the final version of the film. Then. Yeah, I mean I've I kind of I've had a love hate relationship with boards. And I've gone backwards and forwards with it, and like when I start, I, I was a I, I was a storyboard artist to start with in a you know in a, with a very very small s, you know I didn't didn't do much professional work, but I did enough, you know I was, I'm not that great at drawing, but I can, yeah. I can I can muster a board together, and then and then, but with my own stuff, I never used to board it at all because um, I found that my drawings were slightly disingenuous, you know that I would draw. I would solve problems in the drawings that, that couldn't be solved with the camera. You know what I mean? So the the, right, the, right. the framing would be um, uh, much more convenient in the drawings <laughs> than it ever could yeah, be yeah, yeah. in reality. So I, I started falling out out with it. But then more recently, I've I've done it much more. You know, so like 
High Rise and the two, two Doctor Who episodes and all the other scripts we've been developing are all t- totally drawn. Um, right. But whether or not they get used, this is the difference. I think that whether whether they whether the boards get used on set is a different thing. But it's more of a visual visualization tool, you know. So I, I can see it first in yeah. my head, and and then then I shoot a version of it on set. But I think I, I can't see there's any other way of doing it but the way you've done it on Raid. I mean, I and Raid Two because it's so precise and so complicated that stuff, and it could so easily just turn into you know, just people slugging at each other and, and become monotonous, couldn't it? And, and you see that when, when, well, I've done it, when I've had to do fight scenes quick and you just go, oh, right, so you film it this direction and that direction and then the actual action is made in the editing and it's just crap, you know, and it, you just have to get through it really fast. But whereas when you see, when you watch Raid particularly, well, Raid, uh, Raid 2 is particularly, it, it, you f- you feel every decision, you know. You feel every mm-hmm. punch and every kick and every move is like is like chess, so that you could watch it for hours. I mean, you could almost like have no story, that you know, reduce the story down to nothing and just see those fights. And I think that's where, for me, like the 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 first wave of martial arts movies were boring. It could be boring like that, you know, especially if the skill of the people wasn't there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And it, that's, it's, it's, yeah. sorry, I was gonna say it's like one of those things. Well, when um, because when we work on it. I tend to be tend to try to be really involved with them in the pre-pro stage because it's one of the things where if I if I don't know the decisions for like what they're doing and why they're doing it, then there's no way for me to tell then where I should put that camera. And it's almost like the camera is sort of um, finding the details in the choreography. Um, and I, like I've spoken to like choreographers out in the U.S. where they they kind of like you know they're talking about the the amount of work they put into it and then the previs that they put into it themselves and then a previous just gets kind of like cast aside sometimes yeah. um and then and then they see like you know it's that that thing it's that sort of like you know um like covered shots and then like chopped together and stuff i don't think i could get away without my gut with my guys you know they're a pretty sadistic violent bunch so you know so <laughs> i uh, i can't risk it one of the things that was fascinating to me was like watching a field of england a field in england sorry because yeah. like for me it's like it, it kind of maintained it still feels very much like your film but obviously there's a lot more like visually going on in that film, especially the like big set pieces where like it's so, it feels you know the same kind of thing. It feels like so specific in terms of like the the design of it. Was was that kind of like that step where you you were saying about like you know recently with like with High Rise and Doctor Who, you kind of relied more on those like sort of boards a little bit. It, did, did that kind of kick off with the field in England then? Um, I think it's because. I think it's the difference between uh, that movie and Sightseers. Is Sightseers is a uh, has a lot of improvisation in it. So, yeah. so when you when you're dealing with a lot of impro, you mean it means you have to uh, you're re- leaning heavier on the on the edit. Yeah. Because you, how do you wrangle it? You know, I mean, I think we shot like 120 hours on that film of rushes. Wow. So it, you know, you how do you how do you make that make sense? I mean, it's almost like the absolute opposite of of your approach. You know, mm-hmm. this is everything is the chance. <laughs> <There's> no, <laughs> there, there is no um, uh, there is no control. You know, and that and what happens when you do that is that the uh, more specific visual side of it is an editing is an editing muscle rather than a than a necessarily a, a kind of set piece muscle you know i mean there's yeah. bits of set piece editing in it but it's more that peck and par end of the street you know the kind of parallel cutting kind of thing so you can shoot mm-hmm. kind of you yeah. can shoot out sequences which can be quite loose but then you know that you're putting them together in a cut which will make them feel like they're much more specific whereas if you're on one thing for more than a few seconds uh, or a sequence of shots then they have to really make sense you know and if you're doing what you're doing which is you know fives and six and sevens of minutes of things that are very specific then you can't there can't be any gaps or air in it um yeah. so so going from sightseers to, to field where in f- you know when we did when we when i took on sightseers I, there was a script and i said well i like, like this script but it's a jumping off point for this film it's going to be this script plus improvisation but with mm-hmm. Field, we, we, we cut one line out of that script in the, after wow. we shot it. So it was exactly what the script, that script was exactly the film. And, and because it was shot in 12 days, there was no fat on it at all. You know, the assemble edit was the film, more or less. You know, I think, I think the whole thing was... in 12 days? Yeah. I'm so fucking... 
<laughs> but it's like you know it's, 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 it's for course isn't it it's like a movie where five people walk around in a field it's not nothing <laughs> you know yeah, there's, I a know, but there's a it's, shootout it's, but you know yeah this was because for me it was like those big set pieces like that that's sort of like the the mushroom sequence was just so like i mean like like i said earlier it felt so um like predetermined it felt so like planned because those those shots were like like, there, there was so much like beauty in that that sequence, um, and that I, and I, I I mentioned this on Twitter before, but like that moment when Reese comes out of the tent, is probably like yeah. one of the most horrific images I've ever had. Like I couldn't get it out of my brain. It was just it was just stuck in there for so long. I give Matt my DOP like a nightmare when it comes to the shoot because I'm always kind of when I when I do my previs it's just me and a little handy cam that which weighs nothing so yeah. I'm sort of you know bringing it right down low to the ground and then racing up o- up over somebody's shoulder and coming around 360 on someone and like you know running around and then suddenly I'm like okay can you do that but with a red camera with the lens attached to it and then a matte box actually all these things attached to it and so like he's he, like he tends to lose at least like maybe 12 to 14 kg within a within a shoot without a doubt <laughs> in about a month or two he's done um but uh yeah the fig rig it just kind of gives us that flexibility it means that we get uh, a semi-stable shot it's not quite handheld um and we can go low or high within the space of one shot and it doesn't really kind of affect then in terms of the like you know the flexibility side of things then i remember at the end of um a kill list i i, I picked up because that, that was shot on red mx or red red one mx or whatever it's called yeah and i, and I picked the camera up there's the only time i'd ever touched it on the whole shoot <laughs> and i was like fuck me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then i then laurie said oh you, you should put it on the on the easy rig and it was a, it was a tiny bit better but i was like oh my <laughs> yeah. god i can't i can't believe how strong he is you know i can barely you know I think- I, yeah. I think DOPs like to see us holding their cameras so that we realize how much hard work they're going through with it. I always make sure that there's a, a, a publicity shot of me with my my finger, my eye on the lens, uh, you know, looking down it, which is which is the only time I ever do that <laughs> on the whole shoot. Oh, oh we, had, we had this one thing before when uh, when we shoot in uh, Miranda, the first film, we had a like behind the scenes crew fl- uh, filming us, and we had this one location. It was like a like a container yard area, and um, we had all these sort of like crash mats that were designed to make it look like it was concrete bricks. And every single night of that shoot, we got flooded. Every single night, it was like it was like you know pissing down rain, and we get completely flooded off set for about two hours. So then afterwards, then like you know once the once it stopped raining, the art department would go out and they'd start like you know drying the mats off and getting rid of the water and then having to shift the mats away and stuff like this, blah blah blah. And um, we we were there for about like eighteen days, maybe nineteen days. Only one of those nights did me and my producer help out with the crash mats at all. <laughs> that was a night that they not only filmed it but also put it in the edit. And so, like we oh, came off sakes. looking pretty sweet then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there, yeah, there's a bit like that on on, on field in England as well. Because there was loads. Of, I don't know if you saw any of it, but there was just tons and tons of making off the field because we wanted to document the whole process so that it, it can. <laughs> you know, because we'd done it in 12 days, we just wanted to show you how to do it, you know. How it, yeah, I think I saw I saw a video on Vimeo. You put up on Vimeo before, right, was it? Yeah, yeah. I think the making of it is actually longer than the film, which is quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> but Amazing. yeah, there was, there, there's a bit on that where um, they're, they're, we blow a load of paper all over the field. And, then I, and, and uh, in the making of, you can see me diligently helping the rest of the crew pick it up. <laughs> but the, the frame after it, <laughs> I'm just straight in the car to the hotel. You know, but I was I was tired, you know, from all that creating and stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I got a question to ask because this is something I've been dying to know. How did you do the the hammer through the head and kill list? Um, it it's quite straightforward. Oddly, it's a it's. I'll tell you because you know I've I've refused to t- say it to anybody, but. Um, but I'll tell you, <laughs> I know you won't tell anyone else. But um, yeah, but then we got it on this podcast now, which will no, go for everyone. No. <laughs> but it, uh, but what, it, what it 
what it is is it's a rubber hammer. Right. So <laughs> that, that's one 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 thing we did, and then we did uh, uh, then we had a fake head, which yeah. was full of gore and grew, and then we hit that with a real hammer. It's um, seamless. Yeah, and then it's a ta- it's a takeover. So it, it so they did a really amazing job on it. You know, I think what they put they they basically just rotoed the the, the gory head flap thing and just stuck it on his head because it was all just in the same light and it was the camera didn't move it was fine but i think the, the okay. thing about the thing about it is is because it's wide i think and and yeah, yeah. and it's unexpected and it's one shot so that that's where the impact is the actual the actual effect of it is not that complex you know but it's a gag that we've done a lot you know we did it in down terrace as well where the woman gets run over by the car and Gets yeah. pushed in, in front of the car in one shot, and uh, uh, and, it, and in sightseers as well with the bicycle. So it comes out of that, but it comes out of this idea of of um, uh, cause I did a lot of um, before I did any TV work or did any films. I was I shot a lot of um, viral video, and um, a lot of the early viral stuff was fake camcorder footage. Right, right, so right. That's time working out how to do that stuff. And how to make things feel real, or make effects effects work feel as real as possible, um, and a lot of it's to do with not. It's the, the the language of of horror and the language of like effects work is uh, it, it kind of even the the best effects work it says it, it's kind of implicitly saying it's fake because of the way they cut it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's the thing I found. I definitely found that with um, with the way that. Ray two work that it that, that when I when I watched the fight scenes I had a, a a kind of physiological reaction to them beyond like a cinema reaction you know that you felt like you were there you felt you were having that fight happen to you and you get that feeling I don't know if you ever get it but you get the muscles tense in your body at the same positions that the that the fight's happening do you ever have that yeah I have it, I have this problem when I'm watching the stuff back because like um I think I kind of got it from my granddad because when my granddad when I was a kid every time he'd be watching the boxing like I could see my granddad on the couch always kind of like throw in these little sort of like punches and yeah, things yeah. as if he was in the ring right <laughs> um, yeah. and the, the downside is like I do that when the guys are doing the choreography like I don't notice I'm doing it half the time and then you know like it's fine if I'm in like the cinema and it's dark and nobody can see. But yeah. we were doing like um, we were doing like a live demo in Tokyo, and I was watching the footage back, and I'm I'm there up on the stage, stood in the background watching them, and like my 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 feet start moving, my arms start moving along with it, and I'm just praying that nobody else kind of like picked up on it. Like s- some fucker on YouTube is bound to end up making a comment about it at some point, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, you can't I, help. It's a, yeah, it's a direct connection between you and it, and I think that's the that's when you know you've got it <laughs> right, you know, and that. Mm. And I think that's um, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I find that with when when I'm watching the monitor as well, when you're watching the action actors, and sometimes I find if it's meant to be funny, I'm I've got this weird rictus grin on my face, like I'm willing it yeah. to be funny. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, you just yeah, I think that you, you what you need is a hood with um, Velcro on it that will attach between the monitor and your face so that no one can actually <laughs> see the terrible gurning shapes you're making, you know. We should paint them that. I think that would probably sell pretty well in the community, so yeah. Well, well I had about this director who used to wear a cape, and everyone thought he was very pretentious, but what the cape was for is whipping over the top of his head to make a, a tent over the monitor. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's totally the way forward. Yeah, so I was going to go... Yeah, so the, I mean, the reason I asked about that the head hit in Kill List is because, like, that was one thing I felt when I when I watched like, your work and stuff. It's like I have the same kind of interest in that idea of um, it's kind of like showing the audience like an element of violence in a way, but when you put it in that sort of like one shot feel where you feel like you know like you you showing the audience something where they feel like it's almost gonzo that they shouldn't be seeing this that they get feels like it's unbroken that take is unbroken. Yeah. It just gives it this weird feeling of immediacy, and it kind of makes them feel almost like they've seen something they weren't supposed to, you know. And it's it like for me that that's kind of like a little bit exciting. And so we we tried to kind of, uh, you know, put a couple of those elements in in some of our other films. Like in the Raid One, it was the guy being thrown over the balcony until his back yeah. snaps on the wall and stuff, you know. Um, and in the Raid yeah. Two, 
it was the 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 like we did a thing with the a car crashing into a wall and usually like it's the car will just crash and then it's just metal and glass but i was like no nah, let's let's see it all one un- unbroken shot where the guy flies through the windscreen and hits the bonnet on it um, yeah totally. or the guy getting thrown through the the the, the porn guy getting thrown through the through the window as oh. well as a similar thing isn't it where it tracks yeah. it tracks the side with him but yeah i think i think it's right but i think that comes from I mean, it comes from um, like Gene Kelly, and it comes from those mm-hmm. old, uh, like all the musicals and stuff, and the dance routines. Which, when they're unbroken, you just think they're it's skill. You're seeing the skill of the performers, but when they cut it up, you're seeing the skill of the editors, and that's yeah. the, that's the problem. As it goes back to what we were saying before about the, about fight scenes, isn't it? Is when if you don't see that they, I mean, and this is what happens when you like an American like um, style action. So you know the two versions of John Woo, isn't it? You know what the, what what hard bold looks like and what hard target looks like, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, so so you you don't, if you don't have the skill of the of the of the action performers, then it then then it becomes about fast cutting rather than fast moving, and, and I think yeah. that's the that's the killer, isn't it? So you want to see the dancers dance, you know, and you want to see them yeah. do backflips and do all that stuff in in one long take, and you go fuck me, yeah, they're brilliant, and the same and the same is true with the with the fighting, you know, if you can't see these guys. If you're cutting in the middle, absolute middle of a, of a punch and a kick, and all you're doing, a, someone throws a punch and then does a cut, someone does their reaction, then you, it, it, it wears off quite quick, doesn't it? And I think it's on a subconscious yeah. level, you know they're not doing it. Or it's also that stuff you used to get in like the Roger Moore Bonds, isn't it? You know, where, where he'd be <laughs> staggering along in his safari suit, and the next minute he'd be doing a commando roll and jumping onto the back of a motorbike, suddenly slightly thinner. <laughs> and then you, know, you just go, well, this is... I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't ring true, does it? It doesn't. And and also, I I think that life is generally in one take, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Our, our experience. If you, yeah. If you want to see the best example of a, a stuntman not matching up <laughs> with the actual performer, just watch any of the latest uh, Seagal films. It's absolutely <laughs> incredible. Like he, he literally, like he gets he gets younger by at least about twenty years and drops about like a hundred pounds. That's what's doing that. <laughs> it's it's incre- yeah yeah yeah, it's incredible. It's so it's so bizarre how it's how it just it just does not match what uh, whatsoever at all. But um but yeah, like going back to that thing about the, the unbroken taking the thing with it, especially when you talk about like Gene Kelly and stuff like that, like um because uh, Ed Wright introduced me to the um, Lady Be Good, this like old fifties film. Um, mm-hmm. it's like a Busby Berkeley thing, and there's like this one sequence in there. Um. And it's just incredible. It's just this huge shot, and you're just watching it, and you're kind of marveling at the technique of it. But it's like it's one of those things where it's not purely just the dancer anymore either. It's the the stage design. It's the the sort of the reveal of all these different like you know pianists, and then this huge curtain just unveils like the whole band, the jazz band stuff. And it's just like it's just so perfectly executed, so perfectly shot. Um, and I know, like they did something like almost like a. It felt like there was sort of like a an homage to that type of era of films when it was the the, the ending of the artist. And mm. this this something special about that thing. And it's kind of like I keep talking to people. Everyone keeps like getting confused when I say that. Like, yeah, I'd love to do like a musical at some point in my career. Yeah. Um, like well, not quite yet. Not, but yeah. well, it's not. There's not a lot of differences there. I don't think. I think that yeah. it's you know it's dance, it's choreography, the whole thing is this, mm. you know, and the editing isn't doesn't have to be massively different either, does it? I don't think. Yeah. Because it's, it's about it's the movie, it's the, those... the marriage of movement, isn't it, between cuts? Yeah. And that's, yeah. It's the rhythm of it, and and trying to kind of like figure out a way of like, okay, what's the best way to present this? Same like fighting, same with dancing as well. <laughs> yeah. So I find it fascinating. You've just wrapped the high rise, right? Yeah. Is it wrapped? Now? Yeah. So how how was that experience? I know you're not gonna be able to mention much about it at all, but like, you know, what was the ex- what was the experience like? It was was this like a much larger sort of like budget then compared to yeah, it was like what you had previously. Yeah, six times the biggest budget we've had. So it was wow. it was it was massive and it, and a lot of sets, which you know I've I've had a, <laughs> a tiny bit of experience shooting on sets when I've done my TV work, but this is you know it was a massive leap up from say well. Field in England, which was three hundred thousand pounds, you know, the, the last mm-hmm. budget we had to to six million, so it it, it was big, and, and and working with um, kind of big actors as well was quite interesting, you know, with Tom Hiddleston and Jeremy Irons and Sienna Miller and all those guys. So, yeah, it was um, it was great, you know. I I think I got to stretch a few muscles I hadn't 
stretched well stretched in film anyway I've, you know I, I shoot a lot of ads and stuff when i can um <clears> so <throat> that that kind of higher budget stuff isn't as scary as it might be if i'd have just done like down come come from doing um kill list or sightseers or something <laughs> but what are you working on though? Are you, you are you raid freeing at the moment, or are you, are you um, having a lie think... down and a rest? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I wish. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've taken a break from like martial arts for a while. Um, I want to come back and do the raid three when I've I've got like an idea for it. I have like a story concept in mind, but it's all still in my head, and I have like some new action ideas that I want to do with it. Um, but I kind of want to take a step away from martial arts for a bit, so I'm prepping like a script at the moment for something, but. I'm looking to shoot sometime next year out in the US, maybe. Mm. Um, and then, like, I, I got like two two others that are kind of in development at the moment. But the one for next year, I mean, it's um, it's sort of like it's it's within the realm of action again. Um, but you know, more gunplay elements and more like I, I want to do something with a car chase that, like, I haven't maybe I haven't seen before. So I'm trying. I've got like an idea for like how to do something with it. It, where it's a bit ambitious and I'm still trying to figure out the shot list for it um, so yeah it's, it's one of those things where I always talk to my DOP and I say like oh you know I have this idea for a shot um, you're going to hate me for it but let me figure it out in my head first in a way that we can do it without killing anyone and then we'll do it and so like that that tends to be the case uh, for our approach and in terms of the like you know how how we figure out what we're going to do with those camera movements in those action scenes like the, the car chase one and three two was probably the most stressful thing i've ever shot yeah um, did you did you get halfway through it or uh, on the first day of it and, and think why if i put all these people at risk <laughs> do you ever get that feeling that if something goes um, wrong now it's, it's down to me it was easy to write it with the plastic piano back at my house but now we're here yeah um the car chase scene not so much because like a lot of that stuff is like anytime there was a stunt being done like I, I had like a Hong Kong stunt team and they they were brilliant. Like they had so much experience. I kind of wasn't worried. I mean, there were there was like um the the one scene when the guy crashes full on into the wall. Like I was all nervous and panicky and things. And I kept talking to the stunt coordinator and he was just like, oh, this is fine. This is nothing. We've done this a hundred times before. So then that kind of puts you at ease. But then um, we had one in a warehouse where a guy had his back to the car, and the car had to pretty much just drive straight into him, and so. We had this thing, like a system, where he would get a signal because, like, if he kind of reacted too early, it, it wouldn't look right. And so mm. we had this thing where he had to kind of like turn as the car was going to hit through a doorway, then make sure that his feet were kind of raised. So you'd have to kind of go on tiptoes a little bit, so that when the car hit him, you would definitely land on the bonnet and not just crumple underneath it. <laughs> so then, when you're <laughs> when you're when you're getting ready to do a shot like that. That's when you start questioning what you're doing like, with life in general. That's when you start thinking like, oh, like this guy could get really hurt here. Yeah, um, yeah. And like you know, like thankfully, like everything went fine. Like the guy was okay. Like I mean, he got scooped up, didn't go underneath, thank God. Um, but yeah, it's that moment when you like, when you're about to call action on something. That guy is now his life is in your hands, you know. And then you you gotta you gotta kind of like you know just you know hope for the best and make sure that everything's like prep ready and everyone like knows what they're doing like it, it that kind of thing it's all about walk through walk through walk through rehearsal 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 like you know <laughs> the car comes at him at five kilometers first instead of just straight away at 40 um yeah. but yeah it, it can get worrisome <laughs> that's the right yeah. word for it yeah well, I, I i feel that i mean even, even when you even something that isn't even that dangerous i feel a bit you know when you've got get you know crowds of people it's just like oh my god you know yeah, they're all, they're all yeah. here, and it and it and it and it didn't have this didn't have to happen. <laughs> I, I kind <laughs> yeah, of yeah, yeah. made this happen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, all all I had to do was change like one line in a script, which said that he didn't get hit by that car, and then all of a sudden that guy has a much nicer day. Then yeah, yeah, it's like it's, all you have to do is say um, something really dramatic happens just off camera. The sound of yeah. it <laughs> echoes around the room. Oh, basically, like you, you have this moment where the car's just about to hit the door, and then you like time cut to some two guys sat at a table saying, "Oh, do you hear what happened to Steve?" Yeah, he got. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, I think I think there's a really good version of the raid, which is like dinner with Andre, where they just see two guys just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear about that raid? Yeah, man. Wow. <laughs> two hours worth, one shot. <laughs> yeah. <It'd be> amazing. <laughs> 
and we always have that joke on set. We're always saying this all the time. Like whenever we're whenever we're doing prep work for it, whenever we're about to shoot stuff and it's like getting stressful and hard, like the, the the sort of the running joke is always like, okay, next movie we do a drama, right? We just have like two cast members sat in the coffee shop just like drinking and talking and it'll be just one shot master um just one take and we're done like just to kind of get over it because like i, I mean i when we're doing like um like shooting per day like okay our our setups we usually it's kind of like a struggle especially in the action it's usually a struggle to get more than about 15 maybe 15 to 16 setups in a day when it comes to action right, right. um yeah. well, that's, that's do, going some as well isn't it i think we're, we're doing so many takes on it and it's like you each time you're doing it you're draining your actors down as well like again more and more tired more and more fatigued um for the final fight in the way too we had the the kitchen fight like it was mm -hmm. eco and uh chat chat fighting each other like they fight each other like six days straight no break and each day they're doing at least about 12 hours of fighting every day so it's like you know, I I can't do a single hour in the gym and not feel like I fucking died by the next morning. So for them to do 12 hours in one day and then do it for the next six days and then take a two day break and then do another four days. I don't know where they get the stamina from. It's just, it's insane. Do you see it in the edit? Do you see it in the rushes or is it just all consistent? They, they are, they're really good. Like, I mean, they can, they, they, they have this thing whereby they like to have less breaks on that kind of th situation. Cause the moment they do rest, that's when their muscles kind of like start to go cold and start to seize up and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they like they like to just like keep the pace going. And so anytime you have to delay a take or delay the next shot because of maybe like we have to add more makeup to them or like fix something with the camera, like that's that's when they start to get like you know not like frustrated in a visible way, but kind of they start to get a little bit sort of like urgent and they want to they want to get back in and start firing again. Um, but it's 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 a, it's a thing of trust between them as well. Like they they have to really really trust each other, um, so that they know that if one of them accidentally punches the other one full force in the <laughs> face, which does happen with like surprising frequency, then um, they're not gonna like you know stop brawling on set or something afterwards. They're all kind of fine and they pick each other up afterwards. What they definitely don't do is break the take. So that's the worst thing they could do. If there's somebody gets a real hit, the last thing yeah. the other person should do is apologize. Just keep going until we call cut and then apologize. So do you do you, do you savor those takes, the ones that the, the proper punches and go, yeah, that, that actually looks quite good? <laughs> well, what happens is like usually, like cause whenever it's like a, a head hit, we never ever do that for real. We try to always do it with blocking and like cheating the effect. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but body hits are always kind of full contact with them. Um, but when it comes to the, the the face, we try not to because obviously, you know, concussion will set in after 12 days. <laughs> so, uh, but what happens is like sometimes like if, if like Eco is like fighting someone who's not reacting properly, every now and then, like he'll just kind of give me a sneak look. And then I just know immediately it was going to happen. Like, he's just going to hit him for real. Um, or sometimes, you know, if somebody, if it's getting really to that point and Eco hasn't given me that look by now, Mm. Then I'll kind of walk up to him and I'll be like, uh, do, you, do you mind punching him for real? And then <laughs> he'll just be like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then he'll go up and then do it. And then we're like, okay, good, next shot. And then that guy doesn't have to get hit or fake hit ever again. Then. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the look, isn't it? The fact that it's not so much what the punch looks like, because they all look, they, a fake punch and a, and a real punch don't look massively different. But it's the, it, it's the aftermath of the, of the look in the eyes is, to, is different, isn't it, I think? Yeah. And when they no longer know where they are, then it definitely looks real. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, do you see yourself going out to the states then, and working and doing doing action stuff in America? Um, yeah, the the next one would be that. The next one would be me, like you know, trying trying my luck out there. So, fingers crossed, if I don't mess it up, I could do more out there. Um, yeah, it would be nice to be able. To, it's one of the things where it'd be nice to be able to play with like better sort of like you know, facilities and infrastructure, because when we do it over here, we're pretty much like you know like, like cowboys running around and stuff, trying to like secure locations, trying to secure um, you know roads to be closed and stuff. And so to be able to kind of have that better infrastructure out there would be a big help. Yeah, I mean, I'm working on a thing at the moment, which is a big. This like a, a a long shootout, like a long drawn out shootout, where where people are just trapped in one space, taking pot shots at each other for ninety minutes, and and trying to. I've been doing all sorts of research into ballistics. It's really interesting. I mean, I was, it was the difference between what a, what a Hollywood shootout is and what a, what happens with a real gun is you know massive. Um, but one of the things I read, which was really interesting, was that you know if you if you fire a gun at the ground, that the ricochet 
from that bullet isn't like throwing a tennis ball at the ground. It doesn't bounce up at an angle. It right. um, it pancakes and then it aquaplanes. So it, it travels in a straight line along the ground. Oh, no way. Yeah, which is, you just go, what? How that doesn't seem right, <laughs> and uh, yeah. but there's, there's videos of it online of like because there's this this um, thing the FBI guide to how to survive a shootout which was made in the fifties, and uh, yeah they're demonstrating it by shooting on the ground and blowing up balloons like that are on the ground miles away, and they're saying loads of people were getting shot because when they hid behind the police cars they weren't hiding behind the wheels, they thought the police car was giving them cover, but oh, then. Wow. The, the bullets would just fly. And it's the same with a wall as well. If you shoot against a concrete wall, it travels the length of the wall and it wants it from the point of impact. That's amazing. Yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. So I take it like you've incorporated some of those elements into the film then, yeah? Yeah, Without yeah. Without giving well, it away. Yeah, I mean, just that kind of thing and, and just how unreliable guns are, how useless they are, you know. And yeah, yeah. They just jam all the time and you've got to you know, unjam them and... In, in, in stressful situations, well, they're saying that you know how how people barely can shoot straight in a in a in a combat situation. How, you know they hardly get a bullet on on target, or well, police certainly don't, as is demonstrated <laughs> in a lot of the, <laughs> the horror, horror stories <laughs> that come out of uh, um, of America. But yeah, the, it, it, and they're saying that the other thing I was reading that, that people their vision will go into black and white. Oh, really? Yeah, because in a, in, a, in highly stressful situations, you, your brain shuts down anything it doesn't need to survive. Apparently, wow. so you can get tunnel vision, so and black and white, and everything goes into slow motion, just like in the movies. That's amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Holy shit, that's fascinating. I've never heard of that at all. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I just, I, 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 I thought it'd be interesting to see what. You know what what's what it's like in the in the moment of um, as something went down. You know what, and I read that there's there's kind of like um, forensic reports, FBI forensic reports of shootouts online um, of what what actually happened second by second, and they're really mm-hmm. they're really fascinating. I was reading a load of those and going, wow, this is, this could be a film. You know, oh, I'm looking forward to seeing it now, man. I mean, it was and you hate for like <laughs> even more so now. <laughs> Incredible. This is Nick Dawson from Talk House Film, and you've been listening to Ben Wheatley and Gareth Evans in conversation on the Talk House Film podcast. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to Talk House Film and Talk House Music Podcasts on iTunes, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can.